Tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, hello and welcome to our New Zealand Rugby EDSLV uh, webinar. Goodness me. Um, tonight is about, a further, is about how we can further support you and provide clarity on the EDSLVs um, and to allow you to keep up the great work. We've got a few people coming on now. Um, Tony from Tasman, good to have you with us. Sarge here from the mighty Manawa too. So people logging on now, that's great. But as I said, tonight is, is about how we can further support you as match officials to provide clarity on the EDSLVs and to allow you to keep up that great work that you're doing this season. Paul Wayne Masters, Tokoingwa. Um, I'm Wayne um, from New Zealand Rugby and I'll be your host tonight, but we have a real panel of, of world leading law um, referee experts with us this evening. Um, and also we have a very experienced background um, staff or staff in the background who'll be answering questions as well. So got lots of experts in tonight um, that can help us um, with that further clarity. Um, and just an update on how those EDSLVs are going. Nigel from Counties, good to have you with us. Garen from Northland. Gary, we've got some people from Judicial, excellent. Chris from North Harbour, hello to you. Catherine from Y Bush Refs, good to have you with us. Uh, hello there, uh, Eden from, uh, from the Swamp Foxes there in Thames Valley, good to have you with us too. Um, other people coming on, uh, Nev from up in Northland, good to have you with us. I think we'll get on with things. Um, and uh, Ryan, how are you? And we'll get on with things just to let you know um, the format for tonight. Um, the format, first we'll talk about, you know, what are the EDSLVs? Um, what is the rationale behind them? So the why? Um, and also we'll tell you what we know so far, what the data, what the, what the research is telling us so far. Um, I'll then introduce our panel, who many of you know already. Um, we'll talk, uh, we'll do a little bit of a Q&A with our panel. We'll also look to answer any questions you have and we'll let you know how you can do that later. Um, we're gonna look at some video clips or some of you or many of you hopefully have had a chance to look at some video clips that have been sent out. Our panel will talk through those and also an opportunity for you um, as referees to give us some feedback on those, on those, uh, on those videos. We'll use the poll function and we'll get asked a question um, and you get to give us some feedback on what you're seeing in those videos. We'll then answer any questions that you may have along the way. Um, and then also we're gonna ask you how we can further help you um, for the remainder of the season with further support. And then like any good training session, we'll finish with a wrap up, okay? Um, but what we'll do right now is we're just going to talk through, it looks like most people are, are on board with us now. So hi to you, Alex from Queenstown. Um, we're just gonna go through um, what are the three uh, EDSLVs uh, that we're trialing this year? And really important to remember that they are trials. Um, or game innovations. Of course, there's the 1.5 meter scrum push. Um, and this is um, being played in all adult designated non-premier rugby in the community space. Um, EDSLV number two is the offside at the scrum um, for, the for the defending halfbacks, um, their positioning, and that is for all community rugby. And the third one, which we'll probably spend uh, a lot of our time discussing and hearing from our experts tonight is that tackle height. Um, the lowered tackle height for that first tackler, um, and that uh, applies to all levels of community rugby. So that's the what. Um, a little bit of rationale, what's the why for these changes or these trials? Um, firstly, with, in regards to the tackle, um, it's of course to, to look to reduce the incidence of, of injuries. Um, our voice of the participants um, have told New Zealand Rugby um, that tackle safety, um, you know, and this is from feedback from our trials in 2022, um, so the voice of the participant told us that 78% of you felt that it improved tackle safety. So the trials that were done in various regions last year that is now rolled out nationally, 78% of people involved felt that, felt that those improved tackle or tackler safety. 72% um, thought that it increased offloads and a further 73% felt that it speed the game up, so made the game faster. So that's some pretty compelling um, figures um, for the rationale behind them. Um, also, 45, we know that 45% of injuries are tackle related, um, and that's in our professional rugby space. And we know that that, that amount or that uh, percentage increases even further to 60% um, in community rugby. So obviously we want to uh, mitigate or decrease um, those uh, incidents of injuries. So 60% in our community rugby of all injuries are attributed to the tackle. There's been some recent studies that we've done um, that if we know that if the tackle, if there's a tackle that's done above that sternum height, we know that there's four times um, the likelihood of an injury occurring. So approximately 400% more likely 
um, for injuries to happen um, if, there's an, if the tackles are above the sternum, the level of the sternum. Um, and that comes from a, a, a study here actually in New Zealand that's coming out of, that research is coming out of Otago University. Uh, and we also know that high tackles obviously put head, the head of the tackler and the ball carrier in the same position, so they're both competing for that airspace and hence the um, higher likelihood of injury. What are some of the benefits of the EDSLVs? Um, of course, to, to improve safety or increase safety. Um, we think that it improves the confidence for both the tackler and the ball carrier. Uh, also, it can help with improved tackle technique. Uh, it makes the uh, ball um, more contestab contestable for the defending team, so the team making the tackle. Um, and also there's an increase in offloads, which of course um, accelerates or makes, makes the game faster. So a little bit of, uh, of the what, the why. Um, this is what we know so far. So early, early research is telling us this. Uh, early indications are that tackles are lower, so our players are adjusting their tackle height. Um, so that's because of the good officiating that you're doing um, um, uh, alongside positive coaching. Um, so we know that tackles are lower. Um, data so far also indicates that there are more offloads, um, and that's actually nearly doubled. And some research that's been done with um, premier men's competitions the rate of offloads has doubled, which of course makes the game um, faster. Um, in regards to the, the scrum offside uh, law, um, it seems that there's less errors ha happening at the base of the scrum, obviously if there's less pressure from the halfback, um, which is allowing more, um, more attacking opportunities. So early evidence is, is that these uh, EDSLVs or game innovations um, are working. So as I said, if we were to sum that up, Early indications are that the game's a little faster, so you need to keep that CV conditioning going as a match official, um, which also means the ball is in play longer. So yeah, keep doing those Broncos. I just, I just. Um, before we uh, get on um, and ask uh, our experts um, what their thoughts are on things, um, just a couple of bios for the people on the panel. So firstly, we have um, we have Maggie. Uh, Koga Orr, who's with us. She's New Zealand Rugby's Women's uh, Ref Development Manager. She's doing a great job. Just been in that role for a short time and doing a great job there. Um, originally hails from Canada, but been in New Zealand um, for nearly a decade now. Um, she's based up in Auckland uh, and is on our New Zealand um, National uh, Referee Squad um, since 2017. Um, 50 plus first class games. Um, she's refed across the globe and was a ref at the Rugby World Cup uh, 2021, played in 2022. Um, so many of you will um, will have seen uh, Maggie, um, particularly at last last year's Rugby World Cup. Uh, welcome, Maggie. We also have uh, Brandon Roberts. Uh, he's based out of Counties Manukau, uh, Manukau sorry, um, well known in that area. Um, born in South Africa, so he's a good Joburg uh, boy. Um, started refereeing in schools, um, and that's a trend that we'd like to see more of. Um, so he's been active um, as an active referee for 16 years. He's the ref manager um, at Counties Manukau. Um, lots of uh, lots of he's had lots of good memories, lots of uh, great experiences. Um, he's um, both here um, domestically and refereeing overseas um, in both the 15s and the 7s format. Um, and like a lot of our South African um, friends, he's a good outdoors man, enjoys his golf and his fishing. So good to have uh, Brando with us. Um, and last but not least, of course, we have Paul Williams, um, who many of you uh, will know. He's uh, one of our professional referees. Um, you'll recognise him from, of course, um, Super Rugby and, and Test Rugby. Um, he's had nine years in the New Zealand High Performance uh, Referee Squad. Uh, originally, I think, Paul, is it from, from Taranaki, um, from, from Waverley? So um, from the same place as the great, uh, the great thoroughbred uh, Kiwi. Um, uh, uh, and uh, also he was a player. It was actually, I think, uh, if, uh, if, if I'm to believe what I read on, 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 uh, online, uh, Paul, uh, he was selected as a, in the national squad while he was still playing. Um, he was a handy nine, they tell me. Um, um, and also, of course, has been involved in the Rugby World Cup in 2019. And congratulations for being selected as a match official for, uh, for 2023. So um, there'll be, there won't be a panel that's operating in the world tonight that has more um, referee experience than the three people that we have with us this evening. So, so welcome to everybody. And I think, what's next? Let me get my notes sorted here. 
Um, I think what we're going to uh, next is actually to get straight into the um, into the into the questions for the panel. So what we'll do is just sort of take turn about. We'll ask some questions um, of each panelist. Um, if if any of the other panel would like to jump in and help um, to help with those uh, with answering those questions and giving your insights, please do so. So we'll we'll make a start with you, Maggie. Um, so um, first question up is. Uh, how do you set the game up from the beginning? Um, what are some of the techniques um, that you do or the process that you use for talking to coaches, captains, or players before the game? Yeah, I think um, this is probably a really good point because how we set ourselves up probably uh, is, is a massive influence on what type of day we have. Um, and it also gives players an opportunity and coaches an opportunity to be aware of what you're going to look for before they really get into it rather than having to adjust on the fly. Um, and my biggest thing is the message I probably center on is, listen, what we're trying to get rid of are upright face-to-face -face tackles. So what I, what I need to see, what your players need to show me is that they're actually making an effort to bend at the hips. And that's what I really, particularly at a senior rugby level will focus on is if your players are showing me that they're making an effort to bend at the hips, um, it is likely that potentially, you know, I'm going to have some empathy for them. If they make the decision to come in standing fully upright, I don't really have a lot of empathy for them. And they are very likely to be penalized for a high tackle, either because it's over the sternum or because it's over the shoulder um, and would have been a high tackle last year. So I probably focus on what I want to see first and then sort of link it to what I don't want to see as a second point. Hey, thanks for that, Meg. Anything to um, to add to that, uh, Brandon and Paul? Yeah, I'll, I'll quickly jump in there. I think Maggie's um, summed that up really, really nicely. Um, probably the other thing we we fall into the trap too sometimes of, um, you know, being the ones who have to wave the big stick all the time. Um, you know, even uh, Maggie's exactly right in terms of the, the setup piece, but it's also in-game as well. When we're seeing players... Um, you know, executing what's been asked of them really well, um, not being shy to say, hey, look, well done, that's exactly what we're after, you know. Um, you know, some people do it um, at other areas of the game where you get a tackler who rolls away really nicely. Um, you know, thank you, well done. Um, so it's, yeah, Maggie's 100% right. We, we set this up, um, but we also encourage the good behaviour when we see it during the game as well. Hey, some great, some great advice there around um, setting things up early. You spoke, Maggie, about the the body height, uh, and then uh, reinforcing that good behaviour uh, or those pictures that we want to see. Um, thanks for that, Paul. Hey, a reminder, uh, Fano, if you've got questions that are related to what we're discussing, um, or you know, indeed something that you want to have answered either now or later on, um, there's use the Q and A function. So there's a Q and A function. I think you'll find it at the bottom of your screen. Um, put some questions in there because we have backroom staff that are that are there to answer your questions as well. So please use the Q&A function um, to either ask a question related to the discussion or something else that you want to know related to the EDSLVs. Our next question we'll, we're going to throw to Brandon. Um, Brandon, we've heard the wording um, below the sternum and we know that's created some confusion. Um, what would be the way that you would explain the tackle height change to avoid any confusion. Yeah, good evening. Uh, welcome to everyone. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, yeah, I'm fortunate to work in the rugby space um, in a day-to-day -day basis. So big thing for us is education. So our um, language that we use has become really important. So any opportunities that we deliver tackle clinic, um, we start using the term tummy tackles. So um, students in particular find that um, user-friendly and they know exactly where the tummy is, belly button tackles. Um, with maybe some of the adults, um, or if you want to add a bit of a joke or humour element, you can call it bum hugs. So around the bum and then pulling towards you to, to um, bring that ball carry to the ground. So, yeah, tummy tackles are basically the term that we've started using. Hey, thanks for that, uh, Brandon. I'm, I'm learning things all the time. The bum hug. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, we're going to go through another question. I can see some questions coming through on the Q&A too, which is great. So we will, we will get to those. Um, but um, over this one to, to you, uh, Paul, uh, we've heard that the tackle change can be quite hard to officiate or to referee. Um, can you explain the decision-making process 
that goes through your head, um, acknowledging that these that these happen, you know, in real time at, at high speed. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think the first thing we need to acknowledge is, um, you know, at a community referee, you don't as a community referee, you don't have the luxury of, um, you know, falling back on a TMO or a big screen or anything like that. So you are making these decisions like that in the moment. So I guess to take a step back to what Maggie was talking about before, it's the setup piece and and being super clear on the pictures that you need to see in your mind um, so that when you go out there and you see these pictures, it becomes a lot easier to adjudicate. Once you've got that clarity, um, I think it, you know, it certainly helps the process. Um, and probably the other thing there is, you know, having that clear and obvious philosophy. Um, you know, if it sits in the gray and you're not quite sure, then maybe it isn't one to penalise. Whereas if you're very clear on what it is that you need to penalise, um, then it should make that decision-making process um, a lot easier. Um, and I was also thinking too, perhaps, you know, if there's a particular player or a particular team that, you know, are often sitting in that grey area around that tackle height, um, again, this is where we can use our, our management pillar um, to, you know, pass that message on. Hey, look, I think we can be working harder at lowering, lowering this tackle height here, um, you know, rather than just sort of penalising um, shadows, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. It does, Paul. Anything else to add from that, from uh, from Maggie or, or Brandon? It's a it's a really interesting topic. A good, a, you know, an area that our referees, I'm sure, would like to know more about. I think Paul's like it's that that clear and obvious philosophy is is it the first is like we probably all need to acknowledge that this has been a challenge because we are changing what we are looking for and we're changing by a relatively significant height difference what we have allowed um but so even though we need to be really clear on what our new pictures look like we also we don't want to go chasing things that we think might be something or they could be this it's still you know we want something that jumps out and my biggest thing and that's probably what i've elected to focus on is what picture is the tackler showing me and that's going to give me a really good indication as to is this going to be high or not and if they're showing me a, a good picture and it's a gray one, then I'm inclined to give that person the benefit of the doubt that they're doing everything right. And maybe it's half a centimeter off, but they've really made the effort versus, like I said before, the people that don't even make an attempt. This is just an even easier way now to be like, listen, it's definitely high. It's above the sternum. Yeah. I, I like that clear and obvious um, philosophy that you've, that you've spoken about, um, not, not, not being in the gray and then, um, also having that management pillar to be able to fall back on to help to help with that with that clarity. Hey, thank you for that. We're just going to stay with you, Paul. Um, there's a bit of a theme coming through in some of the questions, so and it's not related to what we've just been talking to, but I am going to go to it. It says, um, Paul, how would you set up scrums, um, especially in regards to around the tunnel? Uh, I, I take it we're referring to the nines here. I, I assume it is. Yeah. That, yeah yeah um okay so we'll, we'll leave the front row stuff um for for another day um thankfully um I, again it's it's what we alluded to at the very start it, it all comes down to the setup so you know when we do have that opportunity to speak with the teams prior to the match starting um you know that's that opportunity to speak with the nines and and just make sure there's a really un, a clear understanding about what the expectations are um and once there's that expectation it becomes a lot easier to follow through with any sanction that you may need to to do during the game. Um, and, and probably to another thought that I had, and again, it's around this tackle height. Um, it's not a case of, you know, us as referees enforcing this. Um, it's, a, it's a collective thing. Like we're, we're doing this because it's right for the game. Um, so it's making sure that um, the players understand that, the coaches understand that, and we're doing this as a as a collective rather than it's just us enforcing this change. Um, so I think that's really, really important. And it flows into, the, um, you know, the offside at scrum. It flows into um, the 1.5 metre push as well. Um, these are changes, like Maggie said, they are quite significant. Um, so we just make, need to make sure that we're all working together and on the same page. Awesome. Hey, th thank you, Paul. And I like that a collective approach. Um, we've all got skin in the game, and if we can work together more, um, referees, players, and and um, and coaches, um, then there's more chance we'll get those positive outputs and a better game. 
Hey, thank you for that. Hey, Maggie, just a quick one for, um, for you there. Um, have you found that these changes are, are affecting the momentum of the game? What's your early sort of insights, your experience? Um, I think so. I've, I've been quite fortunate to be able to referee a few different grades. A, I've been able to referee in a few different provinces. So I've been quite fortunate to in the mighty uh, Taranaki, uh, in Canterbury, in Auckland. Um, so I've been able to sort of see it across the country, which has been really interesting. Um, and much like any time we make a significant shift, I think there's some growing pains. Um, and generally, I find in the first 10 minutes, there is an adjustment period. Uh, it, 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 I have noticed it's gotten a bit shorter as the season's gone on and probably the coaching has started to kick in and people have started to actually adjust. Um, but I, I found that it, it is probably you dish out a few more penalties in the first quarter of a game for high tackles than I probably would have in the past. Um, but generally, I think teams are increasingly starting to adjust. Um, and what I always remember is when we first started really going after the tackler for rolling away, it was carnage, right? Like we were dealing out 30 penalties in a game every week. And it was, it was, there were growing pains and it was a bit miserable. And now I look at the average speed of our community level breakdowns and what great compliance we generally have. And it's like, yeah, we did it. Like it was a bit messy at the beginning and we had to put our gum boots on and wade through it, but like we got there. And that's often what I, I think where we will get to with this is it will take a while because we are changing years of behavior. Um, but it is every week I ref club rugby, I find it's getting better and the adjustment period is shorter. And then we're getting more of the game with better momentum. So yeah. If that sort of roundaboutly answers your question. It does, it does. Hey, thank you. Thank you for that, Maggie. And I know, Maggie, I know we've spoken about this before or I've been in, in conversations where you've spoken about this, but I'm going to throw this one to, to Brandon just to, just to spread the love across the panel. Uh, Brandon, uh, any ideas on, on how we can manage the tackle height at teenage level, um, particularly when we have players who are coming from different um, playing backgrounds, perhaps they've come from rugby league um, or, or, or whatever. So how do you, you know, particularly at the teenage level, um, how might you um, how might you manage that tackle height? And then uh, participants, we're going to ask a question of, of you, but um, question for Brandon first. Yep. So um, and nowadays it's, it's quite common for players to play multiple codes, um, especially in our code, it's union and league playing on a Saturday or a midweek game and potentially a, a, like the league on a Sunday. So um, we have to keep that in the back of our minds and use that as an opportunity, again, to educate and seek that clarity potentially before the game even commences. Um, and then when the game has started and we have noticed that the tackle height is creeping up or we can be a bit better to get it um, lower, then we set examples. So we get those clear and obvious high tackles um, we penalise it straight away, team not to play any advantage. So the sanction is is clear. Um, and then just keep working with those players on the run. Remember, boys, girls, we need to start tackling lower. Um, and then, yeah, just constant, stay on their case. If it becomes a trend, then we follow the process and we just warn the, warn the captain. We don't want to escalate the process, but if you leave me with no choice, unfortunately, I have to. So, again, just keeping that safety forefront. Awesome. Hey, thanks. Thanks, Brandon. Any of the other panellists got anything to add to, to add to that? And I'm, then we're going to actually ask a question of our participants. We're good. Excellent. Hey, look, uh, a chance for, for you, the referees um, out there across the Mutsu tonight, to help us out. Um, so using just using the, uh, the chat um, function there, so the, the function where you um, said your hellos at the start of the webinar, Hey, we'd just like to know, um, and I'll also keep the, the webinar going, but if you could just type in the chat room, what do you think, what, what's about the average number um, of penalties um, that make that you make in a game for above the sternum? At the moment, what is sort of the, the you know, out of a 70, 80 minute game, uh, how, many, uh, how many penalties are you dishing out for, um, for tackles above, the, above that sternum height? Um, just be good for us to, good for us to know. Um, and those answers are coming through quick and fast. So that's that's a really good insight for, for us to have um, and a good question that was asked from one of our backroom experts. Um, just while you're putting those answers in there, we'll go to the next question here. Uh, and this one is for, uh, this one will go to, uh, we'll go to Paul. Um, and it's kind of related to what we've just said. Two teams are consistently tackling too high. Um, what would you do in that situation? I think we've probably answered that. 
Um, but anything you can sort of add to that, Paul? Yeah, I think Brandon has actually answered this quite nicely already. Um, you know, it's it's difficult when uh, you're getting two teams that are doing it. Uh, generally, it's probably just one, which makes it a bit easier. Um, but again, it's it's let's come back to what we were talking about at the very start. It's about making sure we set up what the expectations are at the beginning of the game, um, getting a collaborative approach, like we're in this together. Um, and then like Brandon has alluded to, you know, um, having a clear escalation process around, um, you know, it'll be a penalty um, if it continues, um, you know, it's a warning. And then if that continues, we, we're now into card territory. Um, and probably to, to touch on what Maggie said before, like, with any change, it's it's going to be a little bit uncomfortable for a while. Um, you know, and a couple of the comments that I've had made to me um, from community referees here in Taranaki is around, you know, um, we're probably just lacking that consistency at this stage. Um, but I'll, what I've said to them is, you know, that's, that's totally understandable. You know, this is very new to all of us um, and it will take some time. So I think it's just about um, being patient and making sure we still have that collaborative mindset. Excellent. Hey, thanks for that, Paul. And uh, and referees out there, uh, thank you for putting giving us those those sort of stats. Um, those are really sort of valuable insights for us to for us to have. Um, a question for you, uh, Maggie. Um, and I know with coaching, with coaching, we we encourage our coaches to use the observe, analyze, and then decision making uh, loop. And when, in regards when they're looking at error correction for their for their players, um, do you have any visual? Um, um, cues, or can you give any advice um, to help referees um, determine the the tackle height? You know, is it is it the stripes on the jerseys, the logo? You know, how do you how do you manage to stay consistent, um, recognizing too that some tackles are front on, side on, chase tackles? How do you what do you use to to help to help you know see sight where the where the tackle line is or has been made? Yeah, I mean to be fair, like using the stripes or a logo is, is probably actually a really good idea. I, I I've never done that, but maybe maybe that's something I should be doing. Um, I think the biggest thing is probably first off, we can identify situations where we're more likely to get a front on tackle and we sort of need to be on high alert, right? So the pictures where, you know, if you've got like a tap and go penalty where you've got two people running together from a 10 meter distance, like that's one where we need to be on high alert. Like this is likely to be a big collision. So we need to sort of be wary of what picture is this tackler showing me? Are they showing me a positive picture or are they showing me panic stations, Frankenstein arms just coming in straight upright? Um, so probably for me, the biggest thing is trying to identify situations where we're likely to have a dangerous tackle and then really being focused on, okay, what picture am I being presented by the defender? Are they showing me positive intent or are they showing me carelessness, recklessness, whatever you sort of want to term it? Um, is probably like probably more the philosophy that I've tried to use. And I will think too, um, you, and I've sort of seen a few kind of comments through flyby, so I'll just sort of acknowledge it here. You know, if the ball carrier, if the tackler has done everything right, like they've gotten to a really good, safe, bent position, they're trying to wrap, and the ball carrier lowers their head to put their head in the way, that's not necessarily foul play, right? Because we can't say that the tackler has done anything wrong, per se. They're making a legal, safe tackle, and through an unfortunate collision, they have ended up making a tackle above the sternum. But in that context, what more can we really ask of the tackler? If that person has done everything we've asked of them, we can't really say there's foul play there. And I think that sometimes we get a bit caught out thinking, oh, there's head contact, there must be foul play. Um, whereas if they're showing us that positive picture, we need to then take a wider, okay, what, what was the ball carrier doing in that situation? So I think for me is identifying situations where it's likely to happen and then being really focused on what pictures the tackler demonstrating for you. Brandon, you're in the community space uh, there. We only get one shot at it there. We don't have the, you know, the luxury of, of multiple angles, uh, to, you know, uh, raw feeds from, from TV or, or uh, indeed, you know, assistant referees in many cases. So we've only got one set of eyes seeing it once. Any, any, uh, any advice you can give? Yeah, um, look, I, I'm, I'm probably a little bit on the, on the side of caution. Um, when it comes to tackling and safety, 
So um, I personally am probably more inclined to potentially penalise uh, what is still a legal tackle. But from my view at that time, um, something there was some sort of doubt um, that alerted me to basically give the penalty because of a safety element. Um, and that comes down to a positioning as well from a referee. We all know we've been in some um, challenging positions, so to speak, and you haven't had a clear picture um, on when that contact was made. So um, again, advice would be referee the clear and obvious. Um, if it looks, sounds, feels unsafe, then it probably is, and that's when we have to step in and um, do something about it. Hey, awesome. Hey, thanks for that, Brandon. Safety first. Um, I, I like that. And we've got a question that's come through, so um, I'll put it to uh, I'll put it to Paul first, and then again open it up to the panel. Um, any advice on uh, a close to the line low dive? Uh, so we're talking about those grass cutter. Um, sometimes without arms, um, that happens when when teams are hard defending on on the line. Anything there that you're looking for, or yeah, any anything there on how you might manage that, Paul? Gee, I wish you'd throw on this one to Maggie or Brandon. Thanks. <laughs> I will open it up to them. No, no, no. Um, I, I think this this question probably ties in really nicely to what Maggie's just described earlier. You know, like um, I, I think she's done a really nice job around you know identifying those situations where we may get those very low tackles, um, you know, and five metres out, even right on the goal line is a classic example of where we may see those pitches. So I think it's, first of all, having the understanding of and awareness about when that may happen on the field. Um, and then again, to Maggie's point, it was around um, identifying um, is the tackler um, legal in their actions? Because sometimes, you know, those ball carriers do get extremely low they're either in a low carry position or a diving position. And it is very, very hard as a defender to get lower than them and tackle the sternum. Um, so I think that then comes into um, our game understanding, our game, game awareness. Um, but to Brandon's point, you know, um, I agree with him as well. You know, if you've got a defender who's um, launching off the line, um, you know, and, and doesn't really have that, um, element of safety, um, you know, like Brandon said, looks like, smells like, feels like it's a dangerous tackle, then it probably is a dangerous tackle. Um, so I agree with both Maggie and, and Brandon and their explanations around that. Um, and again, I, I have a, a huge amount of um, uh, sympathy for, for those that are refereeing uh, community rugby because, you know, they do get one shot at it um, and that's it. Hey, thanks. Thanks for that, Paul. Hey, I still see some answers coming through there, giving us those insights um, into those um, penalty numbers for that um, above the sternum tackling. Thanks again for those. Um, nice one there at the end there from Ryan Waite saying that there's good compliance, about three. And he says good compliance at, at premier level. So wherever that is, um, uh, Ryan Waite. Waite's a good Taranaki name, so maybe maybe he's from, uh, maybe he's from there. Who knows? Um, but it looks like there's some good compliance happening um, in some of our grades, which is fantastic. I, I can confirm a good Taranaki man, actually, Wayne. Oh, there you go. X, oh, he says X, he says X, Nucky, now by a plenty. Hey, so, don't forget your roots, mate. <laughs> good stuff. Excellent. Hey, nice stuff. Hey, uh, Maggie, um, we're hearing of some creative coaching around where the halfback is at the scrum. We're going to that other EDSLV around the, the offside uh, line for the halfback. Um, we're looking at, uh, sorry, we're hearing some some creative coaching around where the halfback is at the scrum. Um, what's legal and what's not? So a little bit of law there. Perfect. So um, I think, and Paul, I'm sure, knows this deep down in his heart, um, halfbacks are a, a unique breed. They, If you tell them to not do something, they will try their best to find a way to do exactly what you've just told them not to do. Um, and so I certainly will say, particularly because this is new at our senior grades, and um, you know, if you've not played under 13 rugby in 10 or 15 years, this is probably a, a return to something for you. So I've, I've this year included halfbacks in my front row chats. Um, I normally try to give them as little time as possible to speak to me, um, but I've brought them back in the fold this year. I've said, come along, come to the front row chat so that I can say to them, just remember, you need to stay at the tunnel when you're on defense. Um, and then we can also provide clarity in that sense that the, you still have your other options under law. So you can still be back five with the rest of your team if you want, and then you can go wherever you want. Or once the ball has been, been put in, you can retreat to your eight's feet. And again, you can then roam wherever you want. 
So the staying within one meter only applies if the halfback elects to stay at the tunnel. So they basically must stay at the tunnel at, as the furthest point and then within that one meter near space. Um, and this does, again, particularly at community level, we're only one set of eyes. So you, there is a little bit of a trust model here. You can kind of check, check where they are occasionally. Um, but you, I probably, I like to remind them and then just occasionally glance back at them every now and then they're probably getting away with a little bit, but we do our best to keep an eye on them. Um, and again, just, just gentle reminders if you feel like people are forgetting their obligations. Um, and sometimes even just physically standing in their way can be quite handy because they actually can't go past the tunnel if you're standing next to them. Um, but yes, I do think uh, having their clear expectations before the game so that there's no, uh, there's no ability for them to say they didn't know that <laughs> um, makes it easier for you to then manage our uh, creative little friends during the game. I think, thank you, thank you, Maggie. Paul knows all about that as an ex halfback. So, uh, uh, and I know we've got uh, match officials or, or referees on the on the webinar tonight. But there's a yeah, there's a, there's certainly a coaching opportunity there as well um, for coaches to you know create what their what their defensive structure might look like in regards to positioning of the halfback. So there's there's opportunities there um, to play uh, within the law to use the law to their advantage as opposed to trying to work around it. Um, thank you for that, for that, Maggie. Again, just talking about the, the coaching side of things, um, uh, Brandon, we'll, we'll go to you for this and then I'll open it up to the panel. Um, we're looking um, to, to, run, um, to run sessions for our coaches around this, so how we can um, further educate or, or support our coaches in regards to the EDSLVs. Um, what's something that, that you would want coaches or, or you think it would be good for coaches to know and that would support you with the changes. So that collective approach that Paul, you were talking about, what, what what's some messages to give to coaches, do you think? Yeah, look, Brandon, it's, so. it's anyone's dream, right? For everyone to sing off the same song sheet. Um, the more collaboration we can do with our education um, at trainings, um, to, um, training and development nights, the better for, for our game, right? So um, look, we know that current coaching styles are very creative, um, always trying to find the loopholes in, in, within the law and the practicality. Um, so no doubt we'll be learning from each other. Um, yeah, I don't really know exactly what, what else to say around that, uh, but yeah, advice would be get in the same room and um, kick it around, see where we land. Thank you, Brandon. Anything else from anyone on the panel to add to that? Awesome. Hey, thanks. Thanks. Now we're going to just change tack a little bit now. We're going to um, again get some insights uh, from from you, the 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 people that are out there with the whistle out there, and and predominantly I would I would um, surmise as uh, community land. Um, so we're going to. Uh, I know there were some videos that were sent out. There were three video clips that were sent out. Tackle A, B, and C um, that were sent out, and uh, just and also if you haven't seen those videos yet. Um, Anna and the chat function is, is sent through a uh, is sent through a link to have a quick look at those. Um, so if you haven't had a look at them, um, have a look at them now. Um, so there's there's three tackles there, A, B, and C. Um, what we're going to do is I'll get each panel member maybe to talk through each of those tackles, um, and then um, and then if you've got any questions around those video clips, um, again please put them in the Q and A um, the Q and A. Um, Function there, and we'll we'll look to get further clarity from our from our panel. So um, tackle A, you'll see um, a poll's just come up. Um, so for those who have seen the video or are watching the video, um, there's a there's a poll that's just come up now or a question. Um, so tackle A, how would you referee tackle A? So hopefully some of you, many of you, most of you have seen that video or are watching at the moment. Um, just put in, um, just click on, uh, is it play on or is it uh, or is it a sanction of a penalty? Um, and then we'll get uh, we'll get our panel to talk through it. So um, a little bit of time there to go through. So put an answer there for tackle A. How would you referee tackle A? Would your decision be to play on or to penalise? And I think what will happen is that we'll get a uh, we'll get a percentage of what uh, what the answers were um, for each question. 
Um, so there might be a little bit of quiet time while we see what the answer is. Uh, and I might just get uh, one of our panel, might just get Paul, if Paul's across that, uh, or anyone on the panel who's across that uh, that first video uh, with any insights they might like to give while people are putting their answer in. Anyone want to start us off on the panel? Yeah, on sure. Panel? Just, uh... Yep. Quickly had to make sure I got across the right one again and make sure I was talking to the right one. Um, but but that one where oh, are we gonna get it here? Oh, oh get it. hey Harold, you legend. Thank you, mate. <laughs> so we'll get it from the start again. So first tackler obviously doing everything that we've asked of him. And we're looking mm -hmm. at the second tackler there who, yep, while wall is high, um, is is not not in a in a dangerous position. Um, you know, coming from behind the player, momentum's going one way. They're actually going with the player who's falling um, versus, you know, squaring up and actually hitting that player front on. So um, oh, do I give my decision or do I stay quiet? Oh, I think I'll probably I, I, no, I think, we'll, I think <laughs> you'll give the decision. Hopefully, hopefully everyone wasn't sitting, um, waited with bated breath to see what the expert would say. But tell us tell us what uh, what would your decision would be. Yeah, well, I think I'd be quite comfortable to play on from, from that one, Wayne. Do we have consensus across our... So the bunker says play on. Fantastic. I don't know if we can use that word, Cam. Is that just, just for the 13 side game? Hey, here we go. Tackle B. So for those of you who have seen Tackle B, uh, and then I think uh, our video was in the background there, Pete Harold will, will put it on for us. But Tackle B, uh, how, would you ta how would you referee Tackle B? How would you referee tackle B? Let's have a look. Let's have a look at that. And I might get, uh, we'll just watch it um, through another time or two. And then I might just get uh, Brandon just to talk us talk us through there. Yeah, so um, on that one there, the green 11, um, the tackler, um, no real attempt to lower her body position. So no bend by the knees or the hips making first contact clearly above the sternum around the shoulders. Um, the second tackler not really having an effect going around the ball um, as they fall to ground. So to me, that decision would be a penalty. Anything different from our panel? Uh, some of our participants have also, um, uh, have also suggested it might even be a yellow card. Well, they've, they've tempered that by saying maybe. Maybe. Anything else? Uh, um, yeah, I'll, I'll jump in there. I think Brandon's described that really nicely. Um, and, and probably to touch on an earlier point that Maggie raised was around, you know, having that situational awareness of when we may get these types of tackles. Um, when a ball carrier picks and goes from a ruck, which I believe was this case here, um, you know, maybe there isn't the time for the player to lower their height. But um, Brandon's 100% right. Like there needs to be a better attempt to lower the height, get into that 90 degree position. Um, to make a nice legal tackle. Um, the reason why I wouldn't yellow card this, um, we've got to look at the force and the danger involved. Um, and, you know, they're not running from distance. One of them has just picked up a ball and stepped around the corner. Um, so there's a very, very, yeah, someone's put there, very low degree of force. And um, just some stats coming through. I think it's the first question Anna is, is, uh, is talking about, which says roughly 96% of people said, to play on, so I think that that's the first one, the first tackle, right? Um, and it'll be interesting to see what everyone's put down for that second one. Um, it looked like it was Patoni versus Wainui Amata, which would have been a local derby as well. So um, probably would have been a bit of rivalry in that game. Yeah, and uh, and Anna's just come through and said about 94% of people um, in tackle B uh, were correct. So um, so well done there. So we've got a third one, a third one there. We might just. Um, let it run through two or three times and we'll get Maggie to um, talk us through. The question for tackle C is, how would you referee tackle C? Is it play on or is it uh, to penalise? So two options, play on or penalise. Let's have a look. We'll look at it another couple of times and then we'll get, uh, we'll get uh, Maggie to talk us, talk us through. What are you seeing there, Meg? 
So Pete's doing me a favor here by really slowing it down because I think this helps a little bit because right. the kid's feet sure. swinging up make it look a little bit worse than I think it is. Um, and I think this is a really good example of a decision that we don't want to chase, that we only want to get the clear and obvious. So we clearly have a double tackle here. The first person, um, the guy in the scrum cap, um, has number four. So he's made a very good, nice low tackle. So we're certainly happy with him. The second player, um, while the contact looks quite significant, is actually doing what we're asking him to do. So he is bent at the hips. Um, he's making, a, I would say, making a good attempt to make a legal tackle here. Um, I don't see this because of the shape of the ball carrier and the fact that he is bent over. I don't see this as a clear and obvious penalty for me. Um, we have had sort of debates and as referees do, right? We, we can argue about everything. We love doing that. That's part of being a referee. Um, but in the context of, and yeah, I'm, I'm happy that this player is attempting to wrap. I can just see that that's come up in the chat. So I'll just acknowledge that. Um, yes. I think he is unable to wrap because of the fact that the guy slips out from underneath him because of his teammate. Um, so for me, this is play on. Um, and because I don't see this as a clear and obvious high tackle. Um, when we slow it down, if we, we could probably debate it. Um, but for me personally, I don't see this as a clear and obvious decision, given that the second tackler is doing what we've asked of him. He's in a good low bent position um, and the ball carrier's height actually is a mitigating factor as well. So I don't think there's any foul play here. So you heard it here, folks. Uh, Maggie says play on. Um, and we can see some comments coming in there. No doubt Anna will tell us what um, the majority of people think. Again, it looked like a local derby to me, Maris and Pats versus the Axemen or Wellington Football Club, Wellington Football Club, my old club. So again, that would have been a spicy one again. Uh, and 58% are correct. So because there's a lot of moving parts to that, um, then obviously made a little bit more complexity in the in the final decision um, that, that referees have made. Um, so, so a little bit more contestable that one in regards to the decision making. Anything to add to um, to add to what Maggie has just said there, Brandon and Paul? Perhaps no, I well. think um, yeah, Maggie explained it very well. Obviously, it's quite clear in the law that the second tackler can be um, above the sternum, um, which I think in that scenario was the case, um, as long as there was no clear contact with some force with the head or neck. Um, we can. We can live with that one. But also understand that um, you get one view at it at a community level. So um, if, if that's the way that you saw it and you were um, inclined to penalise that because you believe that there was some contact contact, um, contact with the head or neck, then you can sell your decision. Oh, thank you. Anything to add there, Paul? No, uh, not, not too much really, Wayne. I think it's been nicely summed up. And, and again, this is an example of... Um, you know, the ball carriers uh, lowering in height actually having quite a big impact on the picture we see from the defender. Um, you know, in this case here, the defender's actually trying to do as, as best they can to get as low as they can, recognising that the fact that the ball carrier is actually getting very low. Um, and I'm not too sure if anyone on the, on the webinar have, you know, spotted that in Super Rugby recently where you get players running ball carriers and their heads are extremely low to the ground. And when defenders are trying to get underneath them, they've almost got a knee on the ground before they're making that tackle. And while they can look quite dramatic when they go over the back of them, you know, they're actually doing their best to make a legal tackle. Um, but to Brandon's point, again, you get you get one shot at seeing these. And if it looks like, smells like, feels like, then it probably is um, uh, a dangerous tackle. But I, I, again, it's been really clear in our own minds of, what is legal and what's not. Um, having that situational awareness around when we may see these pictures um, and then using common sense and applying our good judgment, good judgment, I guess. Yeah, thank you. Now, there's some good questions coming through uh, in, in the chat um, and our panel are, are answering there. There's a good question there from Zinni in regards to why do we have the different tackle height for the, for the secondary tackler coming in? Um, and I think that's that's been answered there. Um, in regards to what we're doing, um, it's we're, we're trialing it um, with that second tackle being able to come in above the um, above the sternum, but still, of course, um, you know, below that uh, below that shoulder line, not making contact with the neck, etc. Um, but it is a trial, um, and we're doing that in 
and it's, we're able to compare to what's going on in the northern hemisphere as well and, and see how our injury rates and those sorts of things compare. So um, that, that's our rationale for trialing it that way. Um, and, and we'll see what comes out of the of the data that's collected. Um, anything to add to that around that second that you know those other arriving tacklers coming in from our referees? Probably more from from Brandon with it being in that um, in the community space. No, I think um, it's something that again it's an experiment. Um, we know that the intent of potentially more than one tackle is to hold the ball carry up. To potentially form a mall. Um, therefore, we have to allow some sort of staggering of where the heads can go. Because if both the, the tacklers need to go below the sternum, they're going to collide with their heads, and that causes um, exactly what we don't want to see in our game. So it's good to kind of have those stepping stones. Excellent. Hey, thanks for that, Brandon. Hey, uh, Fano, we're getting towards the end of the session. So um, we'll start to uh, we'll start to do a little bit of a a little bit of a wrap up. Um, really appreciate the the insights from our from our um, expert panel and from those in the back room, and also the contributions from all of the match officials, everyone, all of the referees who have joined us uh, 